The words to which I should like to call your attention this morning are to be found in Paul's epistle to the Ephesians in the fourth chapter and the fourteenth verse. The fourteenth verse in the fourth chapter of Paul's epistle to the Ephesians. That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. This, I would remind you again, is part of a larger statement which the Apostle is making here and uh, in which he is dealing particularly with the function of the various offices in the church, the apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers. He says that they have been set in the church by the Lord Jesus Christ himself for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the building up, the edifying of the body of Christ. The ultimate objective being that we all may come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man and to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. We must never lose sight of that goal. There is that day coming when we shall every one of us be perfect within the perfect body of Christ, the church. He the head and we the body. And every one of us is a member in particular. And there is a day coming when the whole body will have attained its final, perfect, full stature. And every one of us, whatever our part or place may be in the body, shall also be perfect and in position and fully carrying out the function for which we were formed. Now that is the goal, the ultimate, the grand objective. But, uh, says the Apostle, we are not already there. And we have to start with ourselves where we are. And the business of all the teaching in the church, all the work of pastors and teachers, is to enable us first to realize where we are at the moment, and then to bring us from that, to enable us to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ until finally we do attain unto that perfection. Well, now, here in this 14th verse, the Apostle is reminding us of what we are at the present time. And we began dealing with this last Sunday morning. And I put it like this, that the first thing we have to realize is that we all start as children in this Christian life. We are all born again, born anew. We start as babes, as infants doesn't matter what we were before. The greatest intellect in the world, when he becomes a Christian, starts as a babe. And all his knowledge and all his learning in other realms is really of no value to him directly in this life. Not that that means that God doesn't use these gifts later. He does. But a man has to start at the beginning. He starts as a babe. And that is why he needs instruction and teaching as everybody else needs it. We must realize that we are children. And then I said we must realize that there are certain things that are characteristic of children. The first is our variableness. Tossed to and fro like waves of the sea. Instability. And the second thing was, of course, our liability to be imposed upon to be carried about by every wind of doctrine. The two things, as we showed, go together. It is because children are what they are that they are liable and subject in this way to be carried about by every wind of doctrine. The very characteristics of children. Don't be misled by that hymn of John Newton's which we've just been reading. He there was concerned to emphasize another aspect of uh, the child, which is essential. Our Lord said, except he be converted and become as little children, he shall in no wise enter into the kingdom. John Newton had that in his mind, and he also had this other element that we must be teachable. But the apostle here is concentrating uh, of necessity upon the dangers of childhood. 
the dangers of childhood because children are children, because they're lacking in knowledge and discrimination and in understanding. But, and this is the point to which we come this morning, the uh, greatest danger perhaps of all about being a child is that the child is uh, so unaware of the terrible dangers by which he is surrounded. And I say that he is thus unaware because he is a child and because of those characteristics of childhood, because of the instability and because of this peculiar proneness to be influenced and especially as I was emphasizing towards the end last Sunday morning, because of the child's peculiar susceptibility to what I call showmanship. The child is always impressed by showmanship, always ready to believe in the next showman that comes along who is plausible. The child is always ready to listen, ready to be taken in because he's a child. And that is why, as the apostle shows here so plainly, the child is in such an extremely dangerous position. And this is how he describes it that we be no more children uh, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Now the child is totally unaware of all that and therefore the part of the business of the teaching and preaching and of the pastors and teachers is to uh, bring these things to the notice of the child and not only that that is why we always have to protect children and to guard them and safeguard them there is this we call it innocence it really is ignorance which is ever the characteristic of a child and he therefore literally has to be protected he's ready to listen to any stranger who may speak to him on the street and who offers him something wonderful or who tells him he can take him and show him something. That's why we are constantly reading of these tragedies in the newspapers. The child is not aware of the dangers and therefore first of all needs protection and to be guarded and shielded. But above all, he needs instruction. He needs to be warned of these things and to be built up against them. And that is what the apostle, of course, is doing in this verse. Now, uh, what are these dangers? What are these dangers about which I'm speaking? As we come to look at them, let us notice these general points. Is it not astonishing to notice the amount of space and of attention which is given in the Bible to this particular question? I wonder whether we've noticed, as we ought to notice, the frequency with which these warnings are given in the scriptures against this very danger. Now, they're almost endless. Let me pick out some for you to, to establish the point. Take what we read just now in the seventh chapter of the Gospel according to St. Matthew. Beware of false prophets, says our Lord. Beware of them. These false prophets that come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravening wolves. What a solemn warning that is. And you remember how he goes on to speak about it and the things he says about such false prophets. But listen to our Lord again in the 24th chapter of the Gospel according to St. Matthew. He says... Um, if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, inasmuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. There's nothing more solemn than that. There in the 24th chapter of the Gospel according to St. Matthew, I have told you before hence as our Lord. And yet how little do we hear about these warnings today? 
And indeed, as I'm hoping to show you later, uh, we even seem to resent these warnings at the present time. The church today uh, doesn't seem to be aware of the danger and doesn't seem to have paid heed to these endless warnings that are to be found in the scriptures. Then take the Apostle Paul. He of everybody is full of this kind of warning. I read last Sunday morning that magnificent and moving statement which Paul made to the elders of this very church of, of Ephesus. It's recorded in the 20th chapter of the book of Acts. He says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch. There it is again. And you can't read any of his epistles without finding this almost everywhere. That is why it's true to say that most of these New Testament uh, epistles contain a very prominent polemical element, an element of argument and of disputation and of reasoning and of warning. Take, for instance, that great 11th chapter of the second epistle to the Corinthians, where the apostle is warning again against these false teachers he says, it's not surprising that they are as they are, for even the devil seems to transform himself into an angel of light. There it is. The epistle to the Galatians really uh, contains nothing apart from this. Think of the epistle to the Philippians, third chapter. Beware of dogs. Beware of the concision. Beware of evil workers. It's a great chapter on this subject. Go to the epistle to the Colossians. And you'll find him warning them to beware of this philosophy which was entangling so many. You get it in the pastoral epistles, science, knowledge, falsely so-called, which some having followed have made shipwreck of the faith, says the apostle. He, he, he's full of these warnings, constantly, everywhere, of this terrible danger confronting the believer in the church. But there's nothing more striking in this respect then the second chapter of Peter's second epistle. He warns his readers that false teachers shall arise amongst them even as false prophets arose amongst the children of Israel under the old dispensation. And he says terrible things about them. And in the epistle of Jude you've got the same thing. The first epistle of John, look at the space it devotes to these antichrists that have arisen. These false teachers. The epistle of Jude has got it. The book of Revelation, the letters to the churches, rarely just expand this very thing. The whole book of Revelation, indeed, is just a great warning to the church to be wary and to be careful because of this particular danger. Now there, I say very hurriedly, is some of the evidence that we have in the New Testament with regard to this matter. The New Testament is a great book of warning warning Christian people to beware of this terrible danger that is round and about them and ever threatening. Now, I want to emphasize a second point about it. And that is, as we are reminded in this verse, the extraordinary language that is used with respect to this danger. I mean by that the strong language which is used the almost violent language which is used. I wonder whether we've ever noticed that. Here again, you get it everywhere. Look at our Lord's own language. Beware, he says, of false prophets. And then do you remember the description? They come to you in sheep's clothing. How innocent they look. How attractive, how charming. But inwardly, they are ravening wolves. Now, you can't say anything more violent than that, yet it's our blessed Lord himself speaking. That's the way in which he characterizes these false teachers. Think of uh, the 23rd chapter of the Gospel according to St. Matthew, where he is warning his own disciples and followers against the Pharisees. 
What are they, he says, but whited sepulchres? Made to look attractive, but inside they're full of nothing but bones and of rottenness. Now, you can't imagine stronger language than that. It's almost violent, and yet it's the Son of God speaking, the incarnation of God's love. And you noticed what I read to you there out of the fourth, 24th chapter of the Gospel according to St. Matthew. Then notice again the terms of the Apostle Paul. Did you notice that expression in, in Acts 20? Grievous wolves, he says. Grievous wolves. He talks of these teachers as being the enemies of the cross of Christ. He says again to the Corinthians, beware, he says, be careful, lest as the serpent beguiled Eve, these false teachers and apostles may beguile you. But there is perhaps nothing stronger than what he says in the second epistle to the Thessalonians in the second chapter and the ninth verse. He is warning them against the Antichrist in his final form. Even him, he says, who is coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish. He says there is a danger of our being carried away by strong delusions that we may believe a lie. Now, there is no stronger language in the whole of the scripture than the language used with regard to this subject. He talks about dogs. John talks about the antichrists. Peter speaks about damnable heresies. Now, the language, you see, is violent. He talks about their pernicious ways. He talks about these people who through covetousness shall with feigned words make merchandise of you. And they all use the term lies with regard to the teaching that is being propagated by such teachers. Indeed, it can be summed up all like this. That all this, according to the scripture, is the result of the serpent. And it has the mark and the character of the serpent upon it. That is how it first came into the life of men. There he was in his perfection in correspondence with God and enjoying communion with God. And the serpent came in and he beguiled Eve with his insinuations and innuendos and suggestions. And all this, says the Bible everywhere, has always been characterized ever since by just that. And here are these children who don't know this. They don't realize it. They're not aware of it. Well, says the apostle. That is why the Lord Jesus Christ has set in the church first apostles, then prophets, and evangelists, and pastors and teachers. Because of all this, because we all start as babes and we're so susceptible to all this, very well we must realize it and we must be warned against it. Now then, let's look at the exact way in which the apostle puts it here. I've painted in the background for you in order that we may all realize that this is not something exceptional. And especially that we may realize that it's not something peculiar to the Apostle Paul. You know, this higher criticism has ever been ready to say, oh yes, that's only Paul. And Paul was a legalist, and Paul uh, was a harsh man, and Paul was annoyed that anybody should believe anything but what he said. Foolish people are ready to say things like that. Even Christian people, they say, but that's only Paul. Well, I've quoted the Lord Jesus Christ to you. He's the one who talks about the ravening wolves. He's the one who speaks about the Pharisees as blind guides. These impostors who garnish the tombs of the saints, but who nevertheless are ever persecuting them and killing them and trying to destroy them. Very well then, let's look, I say, at what the apostle has to say about all this. And I'm emphasizing it for this reason. I cannot imagine, and I defy anybody else to produce, a more perfect description of the situation of the modern Christian than what we, that which we have in this verse. 
the modern Christian, surrounded by cults and false teachings. Here it is. So that as I bring out the terms of the apostles, apply it for yourselves uh, to these many, many false teachings and errors that are offering themselves uh, to the children in the faith at the present time. It's a perfect description. Let's look at it. What is the first thing? Well, the first term we must look at is this. He says that we be no more, that we henceforth be no more children, uh, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. Doctrine means teaching, of course. Ideas, theories, religions, philosophies, supposed modifications of the Christian gospel and the Christian doctrine. Any one of those things that masquerades under the name of religion anyhow somehow and offers itself to men and women as being the most wonderful thing in the world if they only take it up. Every wind of doctrine, it suggests, doesn't it, a multiplicity. It suggests that it may suddenly come from the north and from the south, east and west. In all directions, we are literally surrounded by these errors and false teachings and heresies. It was so then. It is still so. Even in the days of the early church, so soon after the life and death and resurrection of our lords, even in the days of the apostles themselves, they began these winds of doctrine coming from all directions. That is why such a large amount of attention is paid to all this in the pages of the New Testament. But come, uh, now what is it in detail? Well, we start with the last expression, to deceive. By the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Now, the real meaning of that word to deceive there is error. It means a straying from orthodoxy or piety. It means something which is false something which is untrue. It's a lie. That's the meaning of this, to deceive. It's error, the ways of error. And the object of all these things, he says, is to get us into the way of error and into the grip of error. Very well, we must realize that the teaching of the Scripture is quite plainly and specifically that all these things are error. They are false, they are lies. Hence, the strong language that is used. But come, let us notice the way in which he tells us that these errors are taught and propagated. And you notice his description. Every wind of doctrine, he says, which is liable to mislead us and to entrap us. How? Oh, he says, by the slight of men. Now, this is a very interesting word, this word translated slight. Incidentally, let us notice this. It's a fascinating point in, in, the, in the study of language. There are three words used in this one verse about which we can say that they're only used in this verse. The last one is actually used again in this same epistle in chapter 6 and verse 11, but it's only used there. Now, these, if you like the technical term, are Hapax legomena. Uh, hapax legomenon is a word that is only used once in the scriptures. Now the first one was the word we looked at last Sunday morning, the toss to and fro. It's only used here in the whole of scripture. This word slight is only used here in, in scripture and uh, therefore we must pay attention to it. What does it mean? Well, the actual word the apostle used is the word uh, that uh, we use now, uh, the word a dice. It, it means dice playing, playing with a dice, a game of chance, you see, uh, which is played and determined by the throwing of a dice. That's the exact word that the apostle used. So that uh, the impression he conveys is this. It is in connection with such games that there is an opening always to the element of deceit and of trickery and of cheating and chicanery. 
the sleight of hand. While you're not watching very carefully, the man was about to throw the dice, manipulates it somehow, uh, so that he gets the particular figure that he wants. It all comes out of dice playing, chance, and the opportunity that such games give to the the men who can, by the quickness of the hand, deceive the eye. That's the whole idea, the slight of men. Now the apostle is talking about false teachers. He's talking about these people who come with such plausibility uh, to the young Christian. The slight of men, he says. They're like men who are experts at these games which depend upon the throwing of the dice and the element of chance, and they know how to manipulate it. They're so quick and they're so subtle. While you're in your innocence, not really watching or looking at the left hand, the right hand is doing it. The slight of men. But he's not content even with leaving it at that. You would have thought that that was enough. No, he says we can take no risks here. So he goes on to say that they do this. This slight of men is done according to their cunning craftiness. And this means, of course, a kind of craft or cunning which they employ. Which again means a kind of sophistry or trickery. The cleverness, you see, and the subtlety of it all, that's the thing that he's conveying here by cunning craftiness. They know what they're doing, and they're full of cunning and of craft. He's uh, putting it in that pictorial manner, but of course he's referring to their words and to their expressions and uh, uh, to their teaching. How well it's done and how plausible and how sort of the cunning craftiness is the apostle. And then we come to another word, and this is again one of those words that is only used here, and as I say in chapter 6 and in verse 11, he says, whereby they lie in wait. They lie in wait. It's one word, uh, to deceive. What does it mean? Well, this word originally means this. It means to follow somebody and to track him as a wild animal tracks and follows its prey. Have you ever seen a weasel on the track of a rabbit? Once he starts upon that scent, he goes on and on and on. The rabbit runs and suddenly stops and listens. Then he thinks he's safe and goes on, and the weasel slowly goes on. He's tracking him. He's on the track. That's the word that the apostle uses, to follow anyone and to track him as a wild animal tracks its prey. Think of a wolf doing it or any one of these predatory beasts of prey. So that, you see, eventually from that original meaning, the word developed this sense. It conveys the idea of a method, of a very well laid down plan. It conveys the whole idea of deliberate planning and system. Now, you will find that it's translated in the sixth chapter, in verse 11, in these words. Put on the whole armor of God, says Paul, that he may be able to stand against the wiles, the wiles of the devil. Well, now, that is the word that he particularly chose in order to bring this aspect of the question that we are confronted by something that is very methodical and planned almost to perfection. It works exactly as that beast who by his instinct begins to track his poor victim and he knows exactly what he's going to do and he goes on and on until the final moment when he pounces upon him and there he has him in his grip and destroys him and kills him. You realize now why I emphasized at such length the extraordinary character of the language that the scriptures use when they come to deal with this particular subject. So that we can translate our phrase, if you like, like this. He's talking about the slight of men according to the cunning or craft which is used by those who wish to entrap or to capture 
Or if you like, you can translate it like this. Cunning according to the craft which error uses. That, says the apostle, is the kind of thing with which spiritual children are confronted. Now, I want to ask certain questions at this point. Do we realize that? Are we aware that this is our position at the present time? Our Lord says, I have told you beforehand. The Apostle Paul makes exactly the same statement in addressing the elders of the church at Ephesus. So I ask my question. Do we realize that this is our position? Well, let me subdivide my question by putting it in the, in the form of a series of questions. Do we realize, I wonder, as we ought, that error is not something negative, but something very active and something very positive? That error is not merely the absence of full truth or of full teaching. No, it is positive evil. I put it in that form for this reason, that I know that there is a teaching today that uh, has gained a good deal of currency that uh, sin itself should never be regarded as a positive, that sin is merely a negative, an absence of good qualities. I know that the modern flabby mentality says you shouldn't say a man is really bad. What you really mean is that he isn't good that there isn't such a thing as positive evil. Well, now, the same thing comes into this kind of teaching. But it's wrong. You see, the apostle is so characterizing it, as everybody else does in the Bible, as a very positive entity. It's something which is positive and active, and, as we shall see, deliberate. But come, let me come to that second aspect. The second thing we've got to realize about it is that it is planned and that it is organized, that this kind of thing doesn't happen accidentally. And is there anything that is more obvious today than this planning and this method and this organizing? You go and talk to the foreign missionaries. You go and talk to missionaries who are working on the foreign field somewhere, and I think you'll find that they'll tell you that they have more trouble with these false teachings and errors than they have with just unbelief as such. Because you will find that all these errors and cults and false teachings very rarely get converts of their own, but they specialize amongst the lambs. They always come in when the missionary has done his work and there are converts to Christ. They see their opportunity and like these beasts of prey, they pounce in upon them. One of the great major problems on the foreign mission field is this fight which the evangelical faith always has to wage against these other teachings. I don't want to mention uh, particular teachings this morning. You can think of them for yourselves. All these other forms of representing uh, truth and salvation and knowledge of God and of religion. But of course it's not confined to the foreign field. It is equally true of this country. How often has one seen it happening to raw converts? They've suddenly seen the truth, they've come into the faith, and they go on very well. Then suddenly you meet them, and you, tell, you can tell at once that there's some subtle difference in them. They suddenly have become authorities, they know everything. And you discover that they've met one of these beasts of prey, who has introduced them to the teaching. Oh yes, it's all right that you've been converted, but if you really want to be right, and suddenly they give them something cut and dried, there it is all perfect and complete, and the young Christian swallows it whole, and imagines suddenly that he knows everything. But let me emphasize also this aspect of it. You see, they lie in wait, they're, they're, they're methodical, it's this tracking down. They know exactly what they're doing. So I would call attention to the brilliant organizing that characterizes the false teachings always. And not only the brilliant organizing, but the extraordinary zeal. Now, compare the false teachings in this respect with the Christian church. 
And don't you get the impression that they really are doing things in a way that the Christian judge is not doing? Look at the money they can always commend. Look at the books that they put out. Look at the things that they organize and the people who are ready to do the work. It's simply amazing and astonishing. The zeal and the enthusiasm of the cults and the false teachings. And as I say, they're never short of money. They can stage almost anything they like. It's brilliant organizing. Let us pay them that tribute. Our Lord once said that the children of this world are wiser in their generation than the children of light. And it certainly seems to be true in this particular respect. They do it, I say, with a real brilliance in the matter of organizing. It's a real genius. They lie in wait. They've got it all planned out. They've got it all perfectly arranged. Every man knows exactly what he's got to do. There's only one term for it. It's this brilliant method. This brilliant organizing. They lie in wait. Ah, it's not surprising. Because the teaching of the scripture is that it all emanates from the devil himself. He is a liar from the beginning, says our Lord. He is the father of lies. And as the Apostle Paul puts it, he can transform himself into an angel of light. We've got to grant it and to admit it. The most brilliant thing that has ever been done in this world of time was what the devil did to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. It was sheer dazzling brilliance. What a perfect plot. What a perfect scheme. How well he knew how to approach them. How oh, he went to them with all his plausibility. Oh, we've got to admit it. It's perfect planning. It's masterly organization. And it has been the great characteristic of his followers ever since. I say that the false, to use the modern expression, seems to leave the Christian church standing in the matter of brilliant organizing and method. Well, then that leads me to the next point, which is, of course, its subtlety. You notice the reference to the words cunning and craft and slight, deceive. It's all here everywhere, and that is just a way of describing the attractiveness of it all. False teaching always appears to be attractive. That's why people are ready to swallow it. That's why children especially are ready to swallow it. It always seems to be so simple, doesn't it, and so direct. They say you don't have to spend all this time in going through the epistle to the Ephesians and all this about doctrine. It's all so simple. Here it is. You just do this and you've got everything. A shortcut. It's always simple and direct and immediate. And it's all given to you for nothing, as it were. And it's all so gloriously simple. Because that's where the subtlety of it all comes in. Isn't that the whole secret of conjuring and isn't that the secret of these men who used to go around the fairs in the ancient days and there they were throwing things into the bag you were going to get a great bargain a great fortune for half a crown and in the end you had your packet and you had nothing well it, it was all so marvelous and so simple it's all so subtle oh i could illustrate all this very easily by mentioning particular things i don't want to do so but you know them for yourselves. You will find that this is always the characteristic of the false. It, it's, it's simple. It's, it's all done for you, as it were. Come into my section of the church, says a very big section of the Christian church, and we'll do it all for you. You don't have to bother your head about these doctrines and understanding. You come and you confess your sins to us. And the priest puts it all right, and uh, you leave your soul in the keeping of the church. And there you are, you're all right. How subtle it is, how plausible, how attractive, how wonderful it seems to be. That's why it succeeds. And that's why every error and false teaching has ever succeeded from the very beginning. It's the subtlety of the serpent. As the serpent beguiled Eve, his emissaries and agents still continue to deceive and to beguile the innocent and the unsuspecting. Well, says someone, how are we to know all this? How are we to recognize it? 
Well, I shall be answering that, God willing, partly next Sunday morning, but let me say this much at this moment before we come to that. Here is the main thing. There is one characteristic that is invariable about the false, and that is that it always takes from and detracts from the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not surprising that the apostles had the slight of men. In every one of those faults, men is given prominence in some shape or form. It isn't that they deny Christ altogether. Of course not. They're much too clever to do that. But they do deny him. They detract from his glory. You see, the priest or the Virgin Mary or somebody or the church or a pope or some leader or some woman who had a vision or something, every one of them, there's some person, some man, as it were, always given prominence and at the center. And somehow or another, the Lord Jesus Christ isn't the all and in all. That's the characteristic. And it's because the devil hates the Son of God above everybody else. And in some subtle way, he takes from his central Glory from his people. And somehow or another you're giving glory to a man or a collection of men or an institution or some organization or something. It isn't Christ and he alone and he exclusively. You test every teaching by that. Believe not, says the Apostle John in his first epistle. Believe not every teaching. Believe not every doctrine. Believe not every prophet. Many false prophets, he says, have gone abroad. Many antichrists. How do you test them? Oh, that's the test. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God, but is that antichrist. So you test everything by the position given to the Lord Jesus Christ. If he isn't essential, if he isn't central, if he isn't above and beyond all and dwarfing everybody and everything, if you see anything rather than him, beware, I say, beware. So that brings me to my last word. The teaching here as it is everywhere is that this kind of teaching is to be hated and it is to be opposed. I emphasize that as I close. You see what's said about it in the New Testament? You see how it was hated by our Lord and all the apostles? You see how they opposed it and warned the people against it? And how that has been done ever since? But I ask again my question. Is that being done today? My dear friend, I want to put a very personal question to you. What about your attitude towards this? Are you one of those people who says, now look here, there's no need for those negatives. Why not be content with just a positive presentation of the truth? Why must you always be spending so much time on these negatives and saying it isn't this and it isn't that and warning and criticizing other teachings? Now, says the modern man, you know, we must have a spirit of love. And you mustn't be negative like that and critical. Why not just put the positive truth to us? It's so marvelous. Well, my simple answer to all that is that the Lord Jesus Christ didn't do that. He denounced evil. He denounced these false teachers. He said they're ravening wolves. They're like empty sepulchers. They're blind mouths. These people, says Paul, whose God is their belly and who glory in their shame. These are ravenous wolves. That's the language of the scriptures. And my dear friends, I sometimes wonder whether the church is as she is today because we don't follow this New Testament teaching and exhortation. Oh, we say it's so nice. Give us the positive and the simple gospel. And don't give us all these negatives and criticisms. And the result of that is that people don't recognize the error when it meets them. They say, this is very nice, this is very good. The people came to the door, and they were talking about the Bible, and they were offering me books all about the Bible and prophecy and so on. Marvelous, and they take it, and they buy and spend money, and they help to propagate the false teaching, and they see nothing wrong in it. No, why? Because 
They don't realize that error is to be hated. It's to be recognized. It's to be denounced. They think they're so full of a spirit of love. And thus they are beguiled by Satan. And thus the enemy, the beast, the predatory beast that was on their track, has suddenly got them and pounced upon them in all his cleverness and in all his subtlety. My dear friends, it's not a pleasant thing to be negative. It's not a nice thing to have to denounce and to expose error. But feeling in a little measure, I think I can say with humility, the responsibility which the Apostle Paul knew in an infinitely greater degree for your souls and your well-being spiritually, I am compelled to do these things. I know it isn't liked in this modern flabby generation, but it has to be done, I say, lest we be beguiled by these things as the serpent beguiled Eve. We mustn't be any longer children, tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men, according to the cunning craftiness wherein and whereby they lie in wait to deceive. God, open our eyes and have mercy upon us and so teach us and give us discrimination that we shall be able to stand against all the wiles of the devil in this day and generation. Amen. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust audio library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.